Good morning, friends. Can you all see and hear me clearly? Good morning. Yes, yes. wonderful. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. I can hear yes. you clearly. Lovely. Yes, we, yes Lovely. we can. Lovely. All our participants are on board. I'll ask those who are not participating to mute your mics, if you will, please. And we'll begin. My name is Christine Randall. I am the Managing Director of Ian Randall Publishers and the proud publishers of Redemption Song, Reading the Scripture for Social Change by the Right Reverend Dr. Robert McKean Thompson. Just a reminder to mute your mics, friends. We have some esteemed guests with us this morning, and I will tell you, I'm going to both ask permission um, and, and forgiveness, because I'm going to get the, the order of precedence wrong. I am pulling dual duty of moderating, managing the video, flipping the screens, <laughs> as well as prompting the guests. So please forgive me if I, if I make a step, a step wrong. Um, I would like to begin by um, welcoming you all and recognizing, as I said, the most honorable PJ Patterson, former prime minister of Jamaica. I should also like to recognize the most reverend Dr. Howard Gregory, Archbishop of the West Indies, uh, Archdeacon Patrick, who will be joining us on screen shortly. Uh, canons, bishops, archbishops, other members of the clergy. I told you I was going to get it wrong. So remember, I asked for forgiveness and I made the apology as well. Uh, friends, you know, welcome you all. It's very, Please mute your, please you mute your mic. You know, a professional. So this is part of the double duty that I was talking about. Sorry, let me just mute. Well, I'm muted. Okay. Everyone is muted now. Again, welcome. My apologies. Um, you know, in this age, I have been trying to learn to do everything. So I have been not stepping outside of publishing. I've also become a videographer, lighting director, um, sound um, technician, and editor, all of which um, I had to draw on this morning, um, and you'll see why in a bit. But shall we get right into it? Um, I hope you enjoyed the little musical interlude. Again, that was one of the skills I had to employ this morning. Um, but welcome to our discussion forum and virtual launch of Redemption Song. I would like to invite Venerable Patrick Cunningham, Archdeacon of Kingston, to open the proceedings with a prayer, please. Archdeacon, over to you. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Lord God of wisdom, liberation, freedom, and redemption, we give you thanks for your redeeming grace through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. For the good news of salvation, the word made flesh and manifested in scripture. We thank you for the word which has the power to transform and shape lives, thus bringing about social change. As the nation, we celebrate and give you thanks for those who have led the charge in emancipating us from slavery. May we never look back to the flesh pots of Egypt but move forward to the land of promise, singing redemption songs. May your church in this land never lose its role of advocacy and continue to proclaim your liberating, prophetic and healing word and engage a social agenda to bring about equity and justice. We give you thanks for enabling Robert to share his insights in the read of scripture of social change and pray that this book to be launched today will have a powerful impact and facilitate lasting positive social change. 
We thank you for the support given by his family, friends, and the L. Randall publishers in bringing to completion this book, Redemption Song, and pray that God may be glorified by this work. Finally, Lord, we pray that you will guide us in all our doings and further us with your continual help, that in all our works begun, continue and ended in you, we may glorify your name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Archdeacon. And friends, I will tell you, I think this is the first time I've started a launch with so many people present. There are 60 of us online participating at the moment. So welcome again all. It's very difficult for me to see who is coming on because as I say, I'm administering at the same time. Um, so you will forgive me if I'm unable to recognize people as they, as they join us this morning. So I told you about those skills I had to employ. Bishop, uh, Bishop Douglas, who is in Connecticut at the moment, and I should tell you, we're being joined from, by people across the Caribbean as well as in the UK um, and in the US, of course. So our first uh, remarks were to have been given by the right Reverend Ian Douglas, who is in Connecticut, but he had a, a, a conflict. So this morning we had to scramble quite quickly. And I said, I had to learn how to video and, and, and such. So Bishop Douglas's message is coming to us by video, which I hope I will be able to now play for you. Forgive me if I'm not looking directly at you, but um, let me just share my screen so that I can play the video. Bear with me a moment, friends. Bishops Ian Douglas, as well as uh, Bishop Robert Thompson to discuss his new book, Bishop Thompson's new book, Redemption Song, Reading the Scripture for Social Change. This message is being, this, this session is being recorded because Bishop Douglas, who is the Bishop of the Episcopal Church in Connecticut, the USA, has a conflicting engagement, but we didn't want to leave him out. So um, we hope that this will be smoothly and we can insert this into the proceedings later this morning. Gentlemen, over to you. Friends, we're joined this morning by Bishops Ian Douglas, as well as uh, Bishop Robert Thompson, to discuss his new book, Bishop Thompson's new book, Redemption Song, Reading the Scripture for Social Change. This message is being, this, this session is being recorded because Bishop Douglas, who is the Bishop of the Episcopal Church in Connecticut, the USA, has a conflicting engagement but we didn't want to leave him out. So um, we hope that this will be smoothly and we can insert this into the proceedings later this morning. Gentlemen, over to you. Thank you, Christine. And, and it's great to see you, Robert, and to reconnect. And I wanna give you a huge congratulations on the publication of your book, Redemption Song. It's such an important document, such an important <laughs> challenge to the church that I'm so glad that via its publication, it'll be out there for so many more people to, to engage with both in the church and in Jamaican society. I also wanna say, Robert, it was such a blessing to walk the path with you as you did the research for this book in the context of your doctoral studies at the Episcopal Divinity School in Cambridge, Massachusetts. It, it was a blessing and an honor to be your serve as your supervisor as you discovered and learned and found your voice in this writing. Robert, I so remember your work at, which led to this book, which was an act of engagement between Anglican theological method, which was highly grounded in the incarnation in the real stuff of our lives and the way theology and the study of the Bible in Jamaica, particularly 
in the context of colonialism, the disjuncture between those two realities. I think what, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think what you were trying to do in your study is to say that the best of Anglican theological praxis means we have to engage with the social realities of our life. It is not a disembodied exercise. And then what you did was you tried to say, the church thus needs to, in Jamaica, needs to be completely engaged in the social realities, particularly of the poor and the marginalized in your home country. And you use the challenge of Pentecostalism and Rastafarianism to say, look, it can be done. So what are we waiting for as Anglican Christians? There is a strong moral and theological imperative to read the Bible with the eyes of a Jamaican person from the place of liberation. And in that, we will find our redemption song. Is that a fair summary of the way I remember you did your work and what I think is reflected in your book? That is, that is precisely what we have done. And you have, you have indeed summed it up well. Um, and and I'm, I'm, I'm overjoyed that despite the, um, the conflict in your appointments, you're able to, uh, to make this recording possible so that others may hear you, you really, uh, it's no secret, but you, you were very instrumental, um, not only as my advisor and guiding this, but in fact, you whispered in my ears that redemption song um, with, with Bob Marley's music, of course, ringing in your ear. Uh, would be an appropriate topic for for the thesis, and I'm I'm grateful to you for that, and grateful for your love and your support over the years. So great to see you. Well, it's such an honor to be here and be part of this celebration with you. Um, I think what I'd like to ask the question is, you know, you and I have continued our ministry since we were together, and you know in this journey that you were taking in your studies. We continued our ministries as bishops dedicated first and foremost, I believe, to the mission of God, that restoring, reconciling action, that God's liberation for all people is at the heart of what God is about. Sometimes the church participates in that and sometimes the church does not. And we as bishops, I think we've been trying to challenge and invite the church to move from its focus on itself to the mission of God in the world. I know that's what we're trying to do here in Connecticut. So I guess my question is, how's it been for you, Robert, as you continued in your ministry as a bishop? Were you able to move the people of God into a deeper engagement with the social context through reading the Bible in new ways from the ground up? How's it been for you? Well, you know, I, I read, I, I, I worked on this, this thesis, the work, while I was a parish priest, right, be involved in in social engagement, absolutely, at the parish church, St. Andrew's Parish Church. That's correct. And 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 one of my disappointments is that as as bishop, I wasn't able to to continue in that in that very immediate and present way with that social engagement. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping now that I have retired that I'll be able to do some of those um, practical um, and engaging work, certainly with the clergy and congregations and with the wider society. Um, in this sense, and I have shared this with, with Archbishop Gregory, uh, retirement somehow gives me that space. I feel a, a little more liberated as a retired bishop to do that kind of work. Excellent. Well, Robert, my retirement's not that far off. And I would love nothing more than to come to Jamaica and you and I can dialogue on these matters, maybe in clergy conferences or in wider Christian conferences. And together we can sing this redemption song. God bless Thank you so us. much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bishop Douglas. And Bishop Thompson. Okay. 
that's it, folks. So that was Bishop uh, Douglas, the right Reverend Ian T. Douglas, Bishop of the Episcopal Church in Connecticut. And as you can, as you heard, uh, Bishop Thompson's thesis supervisor. So we will move right along and I shall invite the most Reverend Dr. Howard Gregory, Archbishop of the West Indies, uh, to bring us some greetings and further remarks. Archbishop. Thank you very much, uh, Christine. Uh, colleague bishops, um, former Prime Minister Patterson, Bishop Robert, of course, the man of the moment, um, especially invited guests for this launch, uh, brothers and sisters all. Um, like Bishop Douglas, I do have a conflict as I am um, part of a pre conference that is in progress and I've just stepped out to be a part of this launch and due to return. But I want to say, first of all, that I deem it a great honor, um, which Bishop Robert has placed on me, to offer a few comments on the occasion of the launch of his text, Redemption Song, Reading the Scripture for Social Change. And in so doing, I want to offer not only my greetings and good wishes, but that of the entire diocese, and of course, Bishop, your colleagues across the province. Living in a cultural context in which it cannot be said that we are a reading people, and in which information gathering is being rapidly reduced to sound bites, it is always a moment for celebration whether a Jamaican and Caribbean person publishes a book, whether available as hard copy or as a virtual copy to be read as an e-book. This publication, however, is not just an information piece or something for entertainment and relaxation. It is a book which is intended to challenge and engage persons at deep levels of our being. The very title of the book, Redemption Song, brings to mind Bob Marley's famous, famous lyrics. Lyrics of emancipation and liberation of the mind and should by itself. Truck is coming after. Yes, the truck. Should by itself be eye catching and intriguing for the potential reader. The call presented by Bishop Robert for the decolonizing of theology not only resonates with the emancipation and liberation themes, which the title of the book suggests, but revitalizes a movement which began over 50 years ago among Caribbean theologians and which has been sidetracked by a movement from the North which was deliberately designed to quash such thinking and to present a theology for the Caribbean, which would maintain the economic and social status quo. Bishop Robert is to be commended for keeping alive and energizing this endeavor, which needs to be promoted and which occupies a significant section of his publication. Bible study for most persons tends to be seen as a spiritual discipline geared towards self edification and as an expression of piety. What Bishop Robert has done in this work is to invite his readers into a wider vision of Bible study and the reading of scripture as an avenue for emancipation and liberation of people by bringing together the discipline of theology and biblical study in a rarely trodden path of alignment. This approach, which has close affinity with the methodology used in basic ecclesial communities in Latin America, is one which seeks to empower individuals through their engagement of scripture, bring to bear their lived experience 
and their search for social justice and freedom from oppressive systems into serious dialogue with their understanding of the faith. So Bishop Robert, we commend you for this undertaking, even as we commend the work to the church in the hope that we will exercise the discipline of reading the book, engage its analysis of our Caribbean experience, and then as Christians, pursue our study of scripture, drawing on the insights which bring to life in new ways the message of liberation and hope which it, con uh, it really contains. Bishop Robert, I wish you every blessing as you go forward, not only in the publication, but in involving persons in dialogue. I know Bishop Douglas has offered to be a part of that dialogue, but hopefully a wider community that we involve, will involve in the dialogue as they read and engage your text. I wish you every blessing. Thank you so much, Archbishop Gregory, and for your continued leadership of the, the diocese. I know you have a, a very busy schedule these days, coming just before Easter, pre-Synod, and then of course the usual work of the diocese. So we really appreciate your participation this morning. Thank you. You're welcome, my pleasure. And now friends, we're moving into uh, the discussion segment. So we're doing things just a little differently this morning, rather than somebody um, speak to you and extol the virtues of redemption song, which quite frankly has already been done by Archbishop Gregory and Bishop Douglas. Um, we thought it would be a good idea to actually have engagement. And so we invited uh, Ryan Grant and Monique Castle, both of whom are members of the Cathedral of San Diego de la Vega in Spanish town. Uh, Ryan is a medical student and uh, Monique, I believe, is the AYF advisor. And we would invite them now, Ryan and Monique, to engage with each other and with us, if you wish, um, and with Bishop Thompson um, about redemption song. Ryan and Monique, over to you. Uh, hello, good morning. Good morning, good morning. Are you Hi, Ryan. Hello. Ryan, we need you. <laughs> Let's um, okay. Go ahead. Uh, I'm going to begin by um, talking about what I got from the book. Um, particularly, it was a very interesting read. Um, actually, oh, mm -hmm. there we go. <laughs> right. Very interesting. Travel, travel. Keep coming up on. What, my picture? On screen. My picture? No, just the name. Oh. Yes, it was a very interesting read for me, particularly as a young person. Um, many people in my age group may not be, um, may not, may, may tend not to um, read these sorts of texts, but these things interest me. And um, as I was reading the book and going along, I mean, I'm as I was reading the book and going along, when I got to chapter five and I got to the conclusions, it um, really caused me to think about my position as a person and the class in which I am in society and how there are these marginalized groups that um, may not be able to access the word of God in the way that I do. Um, and so what caught my eye first was him, um, Bishop talking about using the Bible as a talking book. And, and um, in using the Bible as a talking book, it kind of invites conversation in a way that regular Sunday services won't do. Bishop Gregory alluded to it as well when he spoke about Bible study. So it's kind of a, a Bible study type forum where you're inviting 
conversation and discussion about the text. And so the use of um, oral hermeneutics, as Bishop puts it, where you're able to engage with marginalized groups, people who, for me, it was people who um, may not be literate or not necessarily illiterate, but may not understand the Bible as the text, as it is written. So speaking about it helps them to understand it more and in understanding it more, they are able to champion their own change and their own transformation, which helps in the overall mission of social transformation. So Bishop spoke about going to the prisons and all the questions that he would get would be, how do you um, see the story of David and Goliath or Daniel in the lion's den, rather than them thinking to themselves or making the story reflect on, be reflective of their life or speaking about the story in their context, you know, how does the story apply to me? I, like David, what are the Goliaths in my life? Um, so I think reading the Bible from that point of view, um, using oral hermeneutics, speaking about it, and he spoke about it with the, um, I think it was Asian, the Asian women group that did it, using oral hermeneutics to speak about the Bible, engaging persons in a way that you would in Bible study, um, so that you can get people to understand, get marginalized groups, the poor people, the people who would not engage in the way that we currently engage in worship now so that they can champion their own transformation and use the Bible as a liberating tool for themselves because they themselves are able to understand it and peruse it and go through it and apply it to their own life. Um, so that's that's what I... I uh, Miss Castle. Okay, great. So um, Ryan and I engaged in discussion about the book and um, it was, let me say, first of all, an honor that Bishop would have asked us to engage in, engage with the book and also to launch the book. And so when Ryan and I were talking, um, we, the same points resonated with us. The use of the language the use of the Bible, the Bible itself being the center of it all. The, the, the Bible is the central focus. What resonated with me was the fact that we have to come to a place where we have to look at language. The language that is used is critical. The setting is also very critical. Bishop noted in his book, the whole idea of the base ecclesial communities and he made reference to uh, a Nicaraguan, Oscar, who spoke of how the Bible is, is to be seen. And in, in the book, Bishop, Bishop um, cited Oscar as saying, listen, if, if you are not interested in reading the Bible for, for transformational purposes, then you might as well just read any damn thing you know, or just pick up any stupid book, but you are using the Bible as a means of setting yourself free, as a means of liberating. And so how do we come into this? What do we do? We have, and that brings us into the setting of the book and the setting of how we present the Bible. We present it in a very base way, in a very practical way, in a way that people can understand. As Ryan said, Looking at, looking at it from the perspective of being in a particular class. And then you're looking at the Bible now as that tool that is to reach everyone. You know, it's supposed to reach everyone. So if you want all persons from all walks of life to understand what is said in the Bible, understand the transformational power of the Bible, then we have to get people to be able to create that create that for them and so when bishop bishop spoke about the sistering group in 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 chapter three of his book he spoke about the sistering group and how they created that platform for so to speak let's say a translation they're able to create that avenue that channel that would provide understanding 
so people get to understand what is being said what is the word saying um he also one of the things that resonated with me was the fact that he also mentioned that in south africa as well um they are helping persons to see the bible from a different perspective not so much in the colonial sense of reading but in their understanding the Bible from their practical realities. And so that's what mm -hmm. I liked about, I liked about the book. I liked the fact that it presented an option for us to see the Bible in a very practical way, to see the Bible um, according to how we live, according to the different, the different aspects of our lives, from the prisoner to the yardman. So those who would prefer to sit in church and read it. Um, so that's those, 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 those points resonated with me. Those jumped out at me. Seeing the Bible as a key. Seeing the Bible as a key. And so it is just so fitting that the book should be entitled Redemption Song. Because we're looking at how it is that we are to be freeing ourselves. How, how are we to be freeing ourselves? And so I keep going back to what Oscar had said, if you're not going to read the Bible for this particular purpose, then pick up another book. But um, this, this, and, this, this is good. Yes, Ryan. And and to further underscore that, Miss Castle, um, mm -hmm. the to underscore the importance of oral hermeneutics and um, a more Bible study type forum, mm -hmm. studying the Scripture and engaging with the Scripture. To, I thought about it this way. I said it to Bishop. When I thought about it, it really made me think hard about the book. Um, if we are to continue to just be bounded by the text itself mm -hmm. and not um, add other things as adjuncts to it that can engage the people, then we're basically ostracizing those marginalized groups. Right, from right, right. God did not intend for only a set set of people to mm -hmm. um, understand. And so that's something that we need to think about because even though it's indirectly and we probably haven't noticed it, this book has called us to notice these things. And yeah. as the church, we need to identify these things that are issues so that we ourselves can change in order to effect change. That is so true. And I'm glad you brought that up too, because um, when we think of presenting the word, um, one of the things that was mentioned in the book is who do we get to lead? Who do we get to lead and who do we get to have us understand? Um, you know, and Bishop had said that he grew up with that perception that the Bible could only be read in church and the Bible could only be read by the priest, but the Bible could be read by, as you mentioned, bringing it into AYF or bringing it into any young adult group or any young church group. The Bible could be read, led and interpreted by us, you know, by us. And that's one of the liberating things. That's one of the, that's one of the things I found so, ah, yes, liberating. The fact that he agreed you know, I grew up with that perception too that the Bible had to be interpreted by a particular person, but it could be interpreted by by me based on my reality. It can be it, it ought to be interpreted by anybody given their reality, you know, yeah. given their reality. So um, I, I, I really appreciated that. I really appreciated that. That was opening my eyes. That was opening my eyes. And so when we read the book and those for those who will access the book and um and read it and see then they can understand that they too will have a role to play in interpreting the word and in sharing the word yeah ryan and monique wow <laughs> you know as a as a publisher i'm only the the, the vehicle by which um writers and authors get their word out. But I can only imagine that for Bishop Robert, it must be um, so fulfilling to hear these uh, mirrored interpretations of, of his work. And, and hopefully what you have done is, is illuminated exactly what was his intention of the book. 
So without putting words into Bishop's uh, mouth, I will invite the right Reverend Dr. Robert uh, McLean Thompson to respond and um, give his own comments on the publication of his work, Redemption Song. Ryan and Monique, thank you very much. All right. Sorry, just to note that, sorry, that Bishop actually said, you know, between Ryan and myself, we would get, you know, 10 minutes to talk about it. But each time Ryan and I meet and we try to condense what we are saying in 10 minutes, we can't. So Bishop, our apologies on going over, but you have to understand we were freed by the word. <laughs> Bishop Thompson, over to you. You need to unmute. Let's try and unmute you. Yes, that's right. OK, there you go. My dear moderator, Christine Randall, uh, His Grace, the most Reverend Howard Gregory, if you are still with us. And, and I'm so glad that Christine mentioned that the Honorable PJ Patterson is, is really part of the, the um, online audience. Monique and Ryan, you have done yourself and, and me and the church proud. I am, um, when I discussed the matter of who will launch this book, Christine and I discussed it and, you know, there were mention of professors and leading theologians. And we said, no, we wanted two young people who were readers. And you have in fact captured the content of the book and have recommended it well. And I want to say thanks to you. As I would say also to, to his grace for his, for his support over the years. We were colleagues at UTC. Now he's the Archbishop and he has affirmed and commended this book. And I thank you very much, Archbishop Howard. Good morning, everyone. And thanks for joining us on this virtual launch of Redemption Song. I'm grateful to all who contributed to the completion of this book. The body of work that eventually ended up as the book, Redemption Song, Reading the Scripture for Social Change, evolved over many years. The initial result of this work was my thesis, as Bishop Douglas mentioned. And that thesis, the title of it is Redemption Song, A Theological Hermeneutics for Social Transformation. This project has been tremendously enriched by the work, the care and devotion of others, some of whom are named in the book. Not by any means the least of them is my dear wife, Charmaine. I make special mention of Burl Francis who provided valuable editorial support and much encouragement. She told me that it could be done. I must thank Ian Randall Publishers for showing faith in partnering with me in this publication. In this regard, I wish to say a special thanks to Christine. At our very first meeting to discuss publication of my manuscript, she expressed her support for the message conveyed in the book, as she was of the view that the message was most relevant for our present context. Redemption Song, she felt, represented the worldview that Ian Randall publishers espouses. Her sound editorial guidance, plus her exceptional management expertise are largely responsible for bringing us together in this virtual launch. Christine, thanks. Mm -hmm. It is often said that one should not judge a book by its cover. However, in this case, the cover faithfully represents what this book is all about. In 1975, as a young curate, I was given the task by my then rector, Ernie Gordon, of building a church in Duhaney Park and invited the artist, Carl Pabosing, to propose a design for a mutual on the sanctuary wall. Carl made me know that he welcomed the opportunity as this was for him a lifelong dream of painting in the church. He said to me, he would gladly take on the assignment if I found sponsorship 
for the paint. Carl's brief was to paint a scene that would reflect the experience of resurrection morning. He claimed his artistic license by painting a scene of the resurrection that includes snow cone vendors and children playing with balloons and flying kites. Far removed from images of olive groves or anything I could have imagined. Part of that scene with black images of Christ and the disciples is captured on the cover of the book as seen here that we are launching today. Was everyone happy with the mural? Not at all. But since none of us was present on resurrection morning, I decided <laughs> to trust Carl's intuition. This is precisely what Redemption Song is about. It is about the church learning to trust the voices on the margins. There are multiple voices within our culture crying out to be heard and be affirmed. Because the Bible provides one of, if not the only alternate reading of history, history from the side of the poor and dominated, it becomes for us the primary resource for social transformation. And so one of the objectives of the book is to assist the church in finding a way to become reconnected to the agenda of those who are least heard in the society and to develop a theological framework that takes critical reflection of one's context seriously. The church can never surrender its prophetic role. However, its prophetic role today is not to stand over against, but to stand with, to embrace and collaborate with voices that exist on the margin, making room for dialogue even with those who see and interpret scripture differently. For example, the Rastafarians. This will no doubt be unsettling for many Christians as it may appear as weakening the faith. But you know what? The spirit has a way of breaking through the familiar vocabulary. Such conversation may appear as a stumbling block, but for God, it may very well be the cornerstone of his missionary design. The Acts of the Apostles tells us that when the gospel moved from Jerusalem to Athens, something changed. Oh, yes. It records how the church and Christianity was able to expand its reach into Gentile world. However, what is often lost is what happened when Jewish Christians and their culture encountered people like Cornelius. It was as Paul encountered the religious cultural milieu of Athens that he started to see how the gospel was enriched. In other words, without realizing it, culture often shapes the voice that answers the voice of Christ. Such shaping began on the day of Pentecost and it continues up to this day. This is exactly the point I am making in the book. I have written nothing that is new. I am simply standing on the shoulders of those who saw the rich tradition of the Christian faith, not as something fixed, but as stories always in dialogue with other voices about God's multicultural, multicolored wisdom. Once again, friends, Thanks for attending and sharing. And thank you, Christine. Thank you, Bishop Thompson. I think you give me more credit than I deserve. I should tell you there are, you have 99 friends participating this morning. So congratulations to you. Congratulations on this worthwhile mm -hmm. publication. I should um, tell you, I'm gonna share something that I didn't share with you before that I have actually had an inquiry from a UK publisher who wishes to license the rights to publish the book for the UK audience. So kudos to you, 
Bishop Gregory. It's been a long time since we have had an, an offer of a, of a co-publication. And I should tell you, it is only fitting that Redemption Song join the line of stellar publications that we, well, all our publications are stellar, but that we are putting out in this, which many of you may not know, is our 30th year of business. Um, and so to have the kind of blessing that you have, have heaped on, on, not only on me, but of course on the company and the work that we do um, is wonderful. And a, and, and a continuing tribute to the kind of work that we are doing amidst the myriad of challenges, which seem to <laughs> multiply daily, as you know. But friends, I want to thank you all so much for tuning in. I don't know, um, Bishop Robert, if I don't know if I should open the floor, so to speak. I think with a hundred of us online, it might become a bit unwieldy. So I won't subject you to that. I'm sure um, most people will reach out to you um, eventually. I should tell you all friends, books are available directly from us. They're also available online at amazon.com or Amazon UK, Amazon Canada, all of those various outlets. It's also available as an ebook if you wish to read it electronically. And of course, it's available at, at, at bookshops island-wide as well. You'll have to purchase your book first and then ask Bishop to, to, to sign for you. And of course, Church House also has, has copies for those who wish to, to, to get there. So at this juncture, I would like to invite Canon Grace Jarvis, I hope she's still with us, to move the closing prayer. Canon Grace? I'm here. Lovely, thank you. Let us pray. And now, Father, we come to express thanks to you, our redeeming God. We thank you that in every age and generation, you journey with your people. And by the wind of your spirit, you breathe new and renewing life in all that we are and do. We thank you especially today for yet another help along that journey, gifted to us in the written words of your servant Robert. May we, being inspired by this work and beyond it, the call of Jesus, your incarnate and liberating word, find strength and courage, all oh, the courage, dear God, to break free from any and all fetters that would bind us, even that of tradition, ecclesiology, and our limited vision of you, that beholding the wideness of your mercy and the kindness in your justice, we may embrace and ever hold fast the fullness of your redeeming love and become channels of the same. Through Jesus Christ, our liberated and liberating God. Amen. 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 Well, friends. Amen. We are uh, just within the hour, so I'm so glad we didn't take up too much of your time this morning, but we're so pleased that you could join us. I'm not going to end the meeting because I know I'm seeing for my, even myself, I'm seeing a lot of um, church brothers and sisters online who I haven't seen in, in so long. And I'm sure um, one or two people wish to give a shout out um, to you, Bishop. So I'm going to leave the, the, the meeting open for a while and I will, I will close it um, as in log off at 11.30. So I'll, I'll leave it open. If anybody also has any questions or just comments that they wish to share. Um, but I'm, as Canon Grace has closed, I'm going to stop the recording. So this is where we will end. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. <laughs>